Hi everyone, I am Johnny. Today I am here to take new photos and show you in this video how it's possible to do a fusion of two images taken with two different filters. To make these photos, I will use a color camera and two filters that have completely different characteristics. I want specifically to show you how it's possible to manage the potential of broadband and narrowband filters and merge them together to be able to manage a single photo that has characteristics that combine both filters. But let's start from the beginning. How do we do in post-production the fusion of two shots taken with two different filters? And above all, what is the simplest and most precise way to be able to use the filters so as not to have problems when we shoot? Many of you asked me, how do you do the fusion of two shots with two different filters? But this time in particular, Optalong asked me how I managed to create a shot like this. After they saw this shot, they asked me, will you show us how you do the fusion using the LQF filter and the L para filter? Thanks to their request, today I'm here to photograph two subjects to show you my results. I hope that this is a prompt and a stimulus for you to try something new in astrophotography. But first of all, let's explain what difference there is between these two filters. The LQF filter is a broadband filter and is one of the latest Optolung products and allows you to photograph with color astronomical cameras, giving us a big help for removing gradients. So it's a filter that helps us improve contrast and cleans the images from light pollution to have a cleaner shot and easier to process. And then we have the El Para filter. Big news of this year for Optolong. It's a bi-band, narrow-band filter with a 10 nanomem passband for H-alpha and O3. I had the chance to test it also from Rome where I live with a Bortle 8.9 Sky. You can see on my channel the tests I did and the photos I published. Really a great filter that impressed me for the result obtained in the shots. The Alpara filter removes in a high manner light pollution, offers a remarkable contrast between sky background and nebulosity, thus releasing more detail on the nebula. And moreover, it has an almost total absence of halos due to very bright stars. So we have two filters of latest generation with completely different characteristics because they work on completely different visual spectra. One filter works on the entire visible spectrum, so from infrared to ultraviolet, capturing all the colors that we find in the middle. The LQF filter, a broadband filter, and the other is a very selective filter that cuts lights except for two channels, namely H-alpha and O3 for a 10 nanomeric bandpass. And it's the narrowband, bi-band, para-filter. So two filters with two very different concepts and functionalities. What I want to show you is the potential you have by combining these two filters using the performant characteristics of both and merging everything into a final image with unique characteristics with the potential of both filters. But to prepare for the fusion of this image, we need to have good enough starting images. So let's see how we can use the filters for optimal capture. The position of the filter during shots can determine the change in performance. I'll tell you immediately the best position of the filter relative to the sensor. The filter must be located as close as possible to the sensor. This is the optical train. During shooting with the Newton, we have a Skywatcher Coma Corrector F4, and from the Coma Corrector, there is a back focus of 55 millimeters to the sensor. So from the Coma Corrector, we have the electronic field rotator, ZWO, with a thickness of 16.5 millimeter, an M54, M48 adapter, two millimeter thick, the filter wheel containing precisely the filters LQF and L Para that I'm using for these captures, which has a thickness of 20 millimeter, it's a ZWO2600 duo camera that has a gap between the sensor and the protective filter of 17.5 millimeter. And all the space that exists between the sensor of the 2600 camera and the coma corrector allows me to reach the correct back focus for photographing. But if I move the filter to the end of the coma corrector where there is a thread to screw the filters, what happens is that the light passing through the optical train between the filter and the sensor undergoes distortions due to the coma corrector lenses. The light drop that we encounter between the various thicknesses we have inserted and everything can lead to unwanted reflections, especially on very particular stars. 
the Alnitak star comes to mind, which is one of the brightest and most annoying. And it's one of those where strange reflections are always just around the corner. Know that I try to test and see firsthand every issue. I don't take anything for granted. So if I tell you, it's because I've done multiple tests, putting the filter after the coma corrector, after the rotator, and in various positions to understand if image disturbances can be created and what the best position is. Okay, but even if there are strange reflections, we do a Photoshopping, and in post-production, we solve everything. It's not exactly like that. My way of handling photos in astrophotography is quite simple and linear. That is, a nice shot with as few retouches as possible will almost certainly give good results. So few disturbances from the filters help to achieve a clean shot. And to do a final integration with an eventual workflow for post-production management, that's really minimal and dispensable. But are there other distortions caused by filters? Well, yes. Putting the filter inside the back focus of the optical train can cause the variation of the ideal focus point for managing the shot. And how do we calculate it and find the correct focus point once we have inserted our filter? That is, there is a simple system to solve this problem. And what other problems do filters cause? Once I've put the filter in front of the rotator, so I've nullified the possibility of reflections, it should be enough. But no, we don't like easy things. Yes, you can solve it simply, but the explanation is a bit complex, so let's help ourselves with images. Then we said that our ideal back focus is 55 millimeters, and in between we can put all the possible accessories respecting this measure. When we insert the filters, what happens is that the focal point changes and shifts slightly and can be explained by this formula, delta focus equal filter thickness divided three. The refractive index is a fundamental property of any material. In practice, anything bends light. Water, air, glass. So when light encounters the filter glass, what happens is that the light finds a distortion point that leads the focus point to be further away compared to the original focal point. This change we call delta focus. To circumvent this change, we must move the back focus point exactly by a third relative to the thickness of the filter. So if I'm using a filter that has a glass thickness of three millimeters divided by three, my focus point will have a shift of one millimeter. So I should add a thickness of one millimeter to adapt my filter to the new optical system created. Once we have inserted the filter in my optical train, especially when the optical system approaches an F4 or F5 to have precision, this distortion becomes more and more evident, and therefore it's necessary to reach the optimal distance. So if we add a thickness, which is one third of the thickness of the filter, we have solved it. And what is the thickness of the Optolong filter that we are using? Optolong tells us that the glass thickness of the filter is 1.85 millimeters. So if we add a thickness of 0.6 millimeters to the back focus, I have found the correct back focus point to have an ideally clean image and without distorted stars. It's enough to add them to the optical train to be able to reach the correct back focus and have a clean image while using the Alpera and LQ filters and thus have a clean shot. If you want, you could also think about the camera tilt, but we'll talk about this thorny problem in another episode. Let's say that using these simple recommendations, we manage to achieve good shots. But do these filters help us in any way? From my astrophotography experience, these two filters are really an important help for three elements that made me choose to photograph with these filters. First of all, an almost total cleaning of the photographed field from gradients. So a contrast between nebulae and a sky background, really important. So this naturally leads to more detail of the subject we are photographing. And finally, an almost total lack of halo, even around the brightest stars. These aspects determine a fundamental help during the shot because they allow a very simple processing, avoiding having to fix anomalies present in the photo in post-production. But let's come to the photos that Optolong asked me for to understand how the fusion between broadband and narrowband occurs. A beautiful set of shots, really demanding I prepared for this test. Four series of shots, 
one series without filter with five shots of 300 seconds, one shot with the LQF filter, five shots of 300 seconds, one shot with the L-Para filter, five shots of 300 seconds. And finally, a fusion between the shots of the LQF filter and the L-Para filter. I prepared this test to make you understand the difference that exists between the various combinations under a medium polluted sky. But beyond this, Optolong also asked me for a final shot, always of the same subject of several hours, to understand how far you can go with a fusion with shots from two filters, how much the signal is amplified and how much it improves in short. Let's see everything step by step. Especially, let's see how you do this fusion. Once I decided the target, I collected all the material and finding available. Nights was almost a titanic task. After Optolong contacted me, practically the sky was impracticable. And I was almost afraid not to be able to finish this project, which in any case was really an intense challenge. So I thought to photograph the M8 complex and its nearby nebulae, an NGC 7000, that is, the North America Nebula. But how do you choose a target? To be able to manage the fusion between broadband and narrowband, can we photograph galaxies and nebulae with this process? So galaxies that have a signal across the whole visible spectrum, they photo... So using a broadband filter, like the LQEF filter in general, we have many galaxies to be able to photograph. M31, M33, M51, M106. But these galaxies, in order to affect a fusion, must also have narrow band signals, so H alpha and O3, that we can manage calmly with the Alpera filter here. The issue becomes a bit complicated because the narrow band signal refines a bit the detail of galaxies. And to collect the narrow band signal, we need several hours of exposure. So galaxies are subjects that lend themselves a lot to affect a fusion, while nebulae must have defined emission and reflection nebulosity components, like the Horsehead Nebula the Orion Nebula, the Hart Nebula, the Swanwall Nebula, in short, here too. The targets are multiple, and we can have fun doing fusion. Every time we have a mix of gas components that allow recording a combined signal with much presence of ionized hydrogen. And our nebulae have a wide presence of ionized hydrogen. Let's say that ionized hydrogen is the most abundant element in the galaxy, emits a red glow with a wavelength of 656 nanometers. So my choice of target was based on the gas elements present in our galaxy that have much signal, both in broadband and in narrowband. And this allows me to mix the signal and merge it together into a single shot. At this point, I have told you how to shoot best, how to choose well the shot and the subject with the right characteristics. And after having made all the shots that I needed for the test and for a final photo, all that remains for me is to tell you how to manage the shots and how to proceed with post-production by processing together.